Well, hello, and uh, welcome to our Hearing Health Foundation research webinar. This event has a live captioner and is being recorded. You can enable closed captions by clicking the CC button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Now, if you need any other assistance using Zoom, please follow the link to the technical guide shared in the chat. Now, by way of introduction, my name is Dr. Anil Lawani. I'm a professor and vice chairman for research in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, as well as the associate dean for student research at Columbia, Columbia University Vagelos College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York. I'm also a proud board member at the Hearing Health Foundation and the head of HHF's Council of Scientific Trustees. The, S the CST oversees the Emerging uh, Research Grants Program, affectionately known as ERG. ERG is a competitive program that awards funds to researchers conducting cutting-edge hearing and balance research. These grants supported many leaders in our field to become successful scientists, including Professor Kenneth Baden, our speaker today. Now let's get the topic. Let's get to the topic of our webinar today. So, age-related listening difficulties, such as speech understanding and memory, are common, especially in a noisy environment. In this webinar, Professor Baden will discuss findings that link brain activity to task performance, shedding light on how we adapt, focus attention, and make decisions during challenging perceptual tasks. We will examine brain systems that support the perception of words from incomplete or noisy information and how these systems may change as we age. Now, Dr. Vaden is an assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the Medical University of South Carolina. He was the recipient of the Emerging Research Grant in 2015, generously funded by Royal Arch Research Assistance. Now, the ERG program, or the Emerging Research Grants Program, that provides seed money to scientists just starting out in their field of research is only possible through the generosity of supporters like you. Now, if you'd like to support our work on hearing loss, tinnitus, and related conditions, you can do so today at hhf.org backslash donate. Now, without further ado, we'll move on to Dr. Baden's presentation. Please ask questions to the Q&A box linked at the bottom of the screen that we'll try to answer following the presentation. Dr. Baden, take it away. Hi, um, thank you very much for um, hosting my talk today. I'm really proud to, to you know, share the stage with so many great um, Hearing Health Foundation webinars um, uh, previously. So um, I wanted to see if I can start clicking through here. Here we go. So the title of my talk today is Brain Activity for Listening. Um, and I'm at the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, I wanted to begin my talk not only by thanking the Hearing Health Foundation for giving me the opportunity to present my research, um, but I'd also like to thank them for um, funding my emergence, emerging research grant um, for uh, looking at brain activity during speech recognition and noise. Um, this came from the Hearing Health Foundation and the Royal Arch Research Assistance. Um, and not only did it help me support um, what I consider very interesting research and maybe um, promising in terms of helping address um, age-related speech um, recognition and noise difficulties, um, but it also provides researchers like me with what is often their first taste of research um, and grant administration as a PI. So um, it, it, you know, there are a lot of things that kind of make you pull your hair out as you administer a grant. Um, not only It's not only fun, but there's also a lot of business involved in terms of understanding budgets and planning. Um, and it really is a great experience to kind of get your feet wet with that entire process. So I really am grateful for that. Um, this also led to a publication. I'll be discussing some of those results um, today. And also, um, it led to preliminary results for a grant submission 
Um, and I'm pleased to share that this was recently, um, I, I received positive funding news on my um, grant application from the NIH NIDCD um, for a project entitled Aging Neural Systems and Communication Difficulties, which really grows out of and builds on the work that I did um, with the Hearing Health Foundation support. So. You know, again, thank you very much. I think that this makes a huge difference um, in, in the development and career um, for a lot of different um, researchers, and which is why I'm always so happy to help, um, you know, review these grants each year. So without further ado, um, you know, just giving you an overview of my research. Um, my research studies brain systems that support speech recognition and noise and how these may change with older age. Um, by linking brain activity to speech recognition, we're starting to better understand the complex picture of age-related listening difficulties. And in the long term, I'm hoping that our findings will help guide more precise measures and diagnoses um, and better target treatments for hearing and communication issues. Um, and you'll see that even though the approach that I'm developing um, is in the kind of topic area of speech recognition and noise and age-related listening difficulties, um, I'm hoping that this will have kind of broader effects because a lot of times we measure or we could measure how long it takes people to do certain tasks, um, which is really the sort of foundational data for this approach. Um, so in terms of, you know, some background on the big question that I'm trying to answer, um, many older adults experience difficulty with speech recognition and noise, um, and that can involve several cognitive and sensory factors. Sometimes there's hearing loss. Sometimes there's, you know, some cognitive slowing um, or working memory issues that can contribute to these difficulties. Um, but one thing that we see is that in older age, on average, we see poorer speech recognition, but there's also a really wide range of performance, much higher variability than you see for younger adults. So some older adults are showing speech recognition and noise performance that's on par with younger adults. And so what are the successful ones doing? So one puzzle piece, I think, is the perceptual recognition of words based on partial information. And I know this is printed text, but I think that, and there's no typo here. Um, this is an example of what I mean when I think about sampling information or gathering partial information information to come to a perceptual conclusion. Um, this came from an email that was making the rounds. It was an early internet meme, September 2003. And it basically says, according to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter what order the letters in the word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it without problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Now, factually, this email was a little bit off. Um, the, you know, there's a really great review of this um, by Matt Davis at Cambridge University, who is a language researcher, um, including the fact that, you know, nobody was doing this research that he's aware of at Cambridge University at the time. <laughs> so, um, but it does have origins in a PhD thesis unpublished um, by Graham Rawlinson in 1976. And interestingly, there are parallel phenomena for acoustic speech, where you can locally reverse segments of speech without listeners really noticing or the intelligibility of speech being greatly affected. So what this is all telling us is that, you know, the brain is capable of taking little pieces of information and building a totally normal percept from it. Like the scrambled letters, noise can limit the cues that are available for the perceptual recognition of speech. However, speech signals take time to unfold, right? They're, we're hearing this, you know, we're hearing a, a, an acoustic signal that takes a lot of time sometimes to complete. Um, it requires memory and selective attention resources and slower recognition can come with costs to communication. So, Listeners sometimes may have to adopt one approach, one of two approaches. Either they're going to take an, you know, a slow and more accurate approach where they use any information that's available for recognition, and maybe they sit for a beat and think about the information in their working memory, and that will all slow them down but guarantee at higher accuracy. 
Um, or they may go with faster recognition, which is less accurate, and it just involves collecting less information for perceptual recognition. So there's a speed accuracy balance that may be involved when people are trying to perform speech recognition in noise tasks or trying to understand speech in realistic, noisy environments like a restaurant. And they're trying to keep up with somebody who's talking very quickly. So the cautious or efficient approach that is adopted by older adults may be contributing in part to the wide range of performance that we see. So I'm gonna begin by reviewing some frontal cortex um, findings that uh, in relation to speech recognition and noise experiments that we've performed. And that kind of raised a question for me that this fast or slow recognition um, model may kind of help us answer. And I, I think our results support that. So this is just this sort of talk overview. So speech recognition and noise involves frontal lobe activity. So we see the frontal cortex involved in language networks, but this is not a language network that we would typically see when people hear speech in clear conditions. Um, when people are listening to speech and background noise, bandpass filtered speech, time compressed speech, or noise vocoded speech, what we see is something that's a little bit more um, closely related to um, frontal regions that are involved in performance monitoring or that elevate activity when intelligibility is challenged. These areas are thought to be involved in performance monitoring with higher activity during incorrect word recognition and lower speech SNR conditions. Um, and this is you know, consistent with performance monitoring and task focused attention in the context of visual tasks or non language tasks. And so, um, you know, we were interested in whether, um, you know, what, what the contribution of these systems are to speech recognition and noise. And so, one thing that we looked at is whether word recognition is improved by the activation of these brain regions and frontal cortex. So again, this is an auditory cortex that we're talking about. Um, these are regions in the brain that are maybe related to performance monitoring or attention. And sure enough, what we've seen with younger adults and older adults are a subset of pieces of those same brain networks when they elevate activity, people recognize words are more likely to recognize words correctly. And that's it's about a six to ten, six to nine percent effect of going, you know, comparing low activity trials to high activity trials. And so we called this phenomenon adaptive control, where people optimize performance by adjusting attention and behavior. So these same brain regions that kind of detect uncertainty or uh, challenging task condition then may be involved in upregulating attention or making other changes that can help you understand speech. And we don't know, for example, if these regions help you lean forward in a noisy restaurant to hear people better, but that's our suspicion that that may be what's happening. Um, we have seen that these regions provide a decreasing benefit from activity in older adults. Um, in older adults with more hearing loss, um, and in general, for people who have poor overall task performance. Um, there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem with the last thing where it may be that they have poorer task performance because these brain regions don't benefit them as much, or it may be that these re brain regions don't benefit them as much because they're performing very poorly. So it's not clear what the, the causal relationship is there. Um, but what's a little, what's what the question is that's raised by this is what exactly is being optimized by this activity? Aside from better accuracy, what's going on? So before I get into that, into a, a new puzzle piece um, for that question, um, I want to talk a little bit about fMRI for auditory research. Um, in order to, to study the brain and what it's doing when you hear sounds, um, we have to deal with the fact that MRI is very loud, um, maybe as loud as a lawnmower, maybe louder. Um, and so what we do is we put insert earphones in people's ears um, that lock out the noise and we present stimuli between scans. And so very quickly in this diagram, you can see a yellow arrow, a yellow arrow pointing to scanner noise 
And we might have background noise playing throughout an experiment. And then a word is presented where the red arrow is. So, you know, we wait about a second to avoid any kind of masking um, from the scanner noise. And then there's a response interval that begins about a second after the word was presented, where the person can say the word out loud, for example, if they could understand what the word was. And then we collect another brain image. And so you can see how the setup allows us to, to easily you know, compare um, performance with pre-stimulus activity, as well as look at the effects of SNR or other manipulations here on subsequent activity in the brain. So this has been a, a, a experiment design that's common to a lot of the experiments that we're, we're um, discussing today. So fast or slow recognition. Um, difficult listening conditions may require adjustments that affect how much information is needed for recognition to occur. So we talked a little bit about fast, you know, less accurate speech recognition or slow, more accurate speech recognition. So what is the optimal balance of speed versus accuracy? And a listener may have to kind of achieve that over the course of trials, making small adjustments. Well, one, one class of computational models called perceptual decision-making models use reaction times to kind of figure out what the balance was that a listener used during the experiment. So again, these are reaction time models that I'm discussing first. Um, and the way that these work um, is that information is building up to a recognition point over time. And when it reaches a, a recognition point, you can perceive what the word is or respond. And so we can see here a criterion is being set first. Then we collect some information. And then recognition occurs. Again, when there's enough information that we've reached a predetermined criterion, then we can understand what was said. So you can see how these things connect to how much information is being used and how quickly does information collect? So using this model that was largely developed in the context of visual object recognition, we hypothesized that noisy speech uses a similar perceptual decision making to those visual object recognition um, experiments. And so we'll, um, we made the prediction that noise can slow information collection Again, this is all based on visual object recognition, but we could see how an easier signal to noise ratio, for example, an easy condition where you can understand words more quickly might lead to faster accumulation rates. And a more difficult signal to noise ratio um, would lead to slower or information collection. So you could see over time, it takes a little bit longer to reach the same threshold or criterion in each situation. Now, unlike information collection, which may be kind of subject to the limits of the signal to noise condition or um, maybe hearing loss, limiting what, what cues are available, the criterion is thought to sort of originate in the listener. So it's not clear whether people are really thinking I'm gonna be super accurate or I'm gonna be super fast. Um, maybe people have a propensity to do these things um, or maybe it's sort of an automatic adjustment, like when you're riding up or down hills on a bicycle and you start speeding up or slowing down. Um, but at any rate, the decision criteria can emphasize accuracy or speed. So this is the part that the listener has some control over. And if you raise your threshold up, that means you're likely to make fewer errors because you've collected more information, but that just takes longer to get to that point slower. And if you lower your criterion, you can go faster, you can recognize the, the word sooner, um, but it's gonna be more error prone. And so again, you can kind of see where people, by having a tendency to go higher accuracy slower or lower accuracy faster, that they might you know, end up with a real range of possible performance, even though they have similar perceptual or sensory abilities. Right? Now distinct brain systems um, also appear to be involved with these processes. Um, I'm not going to name all of these brain regions, but all I want you to kind of take in with this map um, is that there are different areas I've color coded to kind of represent the different networks. And so blue kind of shows us auditory cortex and purple our frontal parietal network. We won't get, really get into that too much. And red is showing us this frontal um, cortex system that I, I really like to study. 
Um, and I've seen these predictive effects on behavior. And, and so just to sort of relate these components, um, I did this nice uh, animation where we can see the criterion being set by frontal cortex, information um, being collected in auditory and frontal parietal networks, so these blue and purple areas. And then red is going to weigh in again. It's going to see, you know, it's going to respond if you're making an error, or it's going to respond if there's a lot of uncertainty about your response. There's going to be elevated activity there. And so that may feed into the next criterion setting. So the experiment that I'm going to describe really briefly is uh, it involved middle-aged and older adults. And this was the one that I performed with support from the Hearing Health Foundation. Um, there were 30 individuals. They were ranged in age from 45 to 80 years old. And we screened their hearing to limit audibility differences. And this is based on an, an approach where we know what the presentation level of the noise and the stimulus are, and we bandpass filter the sounds in order to make sure that we're kind of in a sweet spot in the audiogram. And then we make sure that people's thresholds fall into that sweet spot so that if you have really good hearing, you don't hear a whole lot more. And if you had really poor hearing, you wouldn't hear a whole lot less. So we do have a range of hearing between 45 and 80 years of age. Um, but we kind of knew in advance that we were going to eliminate hearing loss effects and in, in trying to study aging, um, age-related differences in this study. Um, in the sparse fMRI experiment, so I've already talked about sparse fMRI designs, um, participants were listening to words in a multi-talker babble. And so it just sounds like cafeteria noise, and that's playing constantly in the background. And we presented a word in between the two scans. So this is exactly what we looked at. Their task was to repeat the word out loud or say nope. Um, and from the recordings that we made during the response interval, we were able to tell what their reaction time was. So how long did it take them to start saying the word? Um, and so we were able to get speech onset times for 28 out of the 30 participants. Uh, the recordings were lost for two. Um, response times were fitted with the perceptual decision-making model that I described earlier. And we found that more intelligible words resulted in significantly faster information collection. So you can see in this plus 10 SNR that this slope is a little steeper. That means that it's collecting faster. Um, and we saw that a more cautious criteria was adopted in the pl plus 10 SNR as well. So in the most intelligible speech condition, people tended to be comfortable with raising their threshold for when they would recognize a word. And again, that's anthropomorphizing it a little bit. I don't know if people felt like <laughs> raising a, a threshold, but at any rate, their thresholds raised and there was a comfortable time margin where they could afford to take more time or they could just afford to collect more information in the same amount of time. Conversely, in the harder condition, we're seeing that, that the criteria actually lowered here. So this dotted line is lower and that's what that represents. So the noise effects were indeed similar to what's been observed for visual object recognition in conditions that have perceptual uncertainty. Looking at the brain imaging results now, we saw that pre-stimulus brain activity was associated with, again, higher likelihood for correct recognition. And for these middle-aged and older adults, that effect had about a 9% benefit, um, comparing low activity pre-stimulus activity to high pre-stimulus activity. Um, and we saw significantly higher, more cautious trials on the, uh, or more cautious criteria on the trials with higher pre-stimulus activity. And we saw significantly greater activity, I'm sorry, benefit from this activity in these frontal cortex regions for the individuals who had the highest criteria. So again, it looks like the people who are really using this brain system are the ones who are emphasizing accurate task performance over speed. So in conclusion, accuracy, the speed and accuracy balance appeared to change in response to listening conditions during a word recognition task. Um, frontal cortex pre-stimulus activity benefits speech recognition and noise and that appears to involve decision criteria adjustments. So people are willing to slow down a little bit and take more information in during recognition when more information is flowing in faster. 
And in future studies that are actually kind of in progress currently, um, we're going to examine age-related differences in how much and how quickly information is collected for speech recognition and noise. And what I mean by that is we'll start taking apart and manipulating criteria and information collection separately so we can figure out the degree to which each may change with age. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators, um, Mark Eckert, who's been a speaker in, in the webinars before, Judy Dubno, who I'm sure many of you know, um, as well as others who worked in my um, program very closely with me, Jane Alstrom, Lois Matthews, Kelly Harris, Susan Tubner Rhodes, and Karen, uh, Carolyn McClaskey. And of course, funding sources, the Hearing Health Foundation prominently featured there because this was a study that was, was done with the Emerging Research Grant. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention. Um, and uh, to learn a little bit more about this topic, um, you could look at a, an overview article that where Mark Eckert was the, the um, first author, uh, where we looked at, you know, is listening and noise worth it? Um, I think that that's a really nice uh, article kind of tying together findings throughout the attention in neuroscience literature, as well as speech recognition and noise and aging. Um, and then if you look at, if you want to look at the study that I described today here, um, then you could look at evidence for cortical adjustments to perceptual decision criteria during speech and noise or word recognition and noise. So thank you. Well, Dr. Vaden, that was, that was really terrific. I, I think you did an incredible job of explaining very complex ideas uh, <laughs> for our really uh, mixed level audiences. Our, our first <laughs> question, um, do you think the changes we're seeing are part of a normal aging phenomenon? It's sort of a question that Dr. Fink has asked us. Is this, uh -huh. is this normal aging phenomenon or is this the consequences of experiences or noise exposure or other exposures, good and bad, and their consequences? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think, um, you know, that the, the long story, the, to make a long story short, I think, yes, I think it's all of the above. I have a feeling that there are both natural aging processes that lead to this average decline that we're seeing. And we're also seeing some people who are dealing with age um, in a way that is worse than others, right? So when I talked about the, the sort of spread, this, is, this would have been a good scatter plot for this talk. I'm regretting not including it. But if you could see the speech recognition scores at 80 years old and see the guy who's doing just as well as the 20 year old, or the person who's at floor and they got the worst score in the entire study. Um, they're, dif they're different people. They're people who are operating completely differently at their age. So I think, you know, it's, it's very possible that the person who's performing like a 20 year old has lucked out and not been exposed to a lot of things in the environment and protected their hearing very carefully and not experienced any cognitive decline. And they may be implementing a perceptual strategy like the things that I'm describing today in order to kind of be at that high point. I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen just so people can see sure. you as a as a yeah. bigger square in our in our Brady bunch of <laughs> ape here. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions um, and I hope you'll I'm going to ask some questions that may or may not directly pertain to what you just said, um, but that come uh -huh. up in clinical practice or might as I get older now in my daily experience. And so, you know, I've increasingly used closed caption to yeah. watch television shows. And I'm wondering, should I not do that? Should I go continue to struggle and get <laughs> practice of listening to, you know, the bad signal so that I don't, my brain doesn't age quicker because of lack of experience? You know, that's a, that's a really great question. And um, I think that there may be some incoming results on that in terms of um, multimodal speech. Um, so I, I think that it probably is not, it doesn't hurt to give yourself more information sources. I, I would say that that's probably a best practice in ensuring that the flow of information is maximized, um, and you can keep up with what's going on. And I do the same thing. So <laughs> I'm going to stick with closed captions myself. <laughs> so one thing that does come up in my clinical practice is, um, you know, we, we have people come for hearing tests and, and uh, we may have a conversation about hearing aids. And, and initially, they don't want to proceed with hearing aids. And they come every, you know, for two, three years in a row. And we find that the hearing doesn't change very much, but they report more difficulty with, you know, speech recognition. So 
Do you also share the thought that our ear, the sensory organ, and our brain can really age di at different rates? And you know, and and that um, I'm going to stop there. Just take it away from yeah. any, any direction you want. Yeah, to. yeah. No, I think I absolutely agree with that view, 100. percent Yeah, I think that I think that um, the work by Larry Humes, I think I, that comes to mind. In he, we used to have this um, aging and speech communication conference. Um, and he presented some of his work there. It's been published since then. But um, yeah, you absolutely can see these independent declines occurring in terms of our vision, our memory, our work, you know, working memory, our selective attention, our ability to, to just hear. Um, all of these things can kind of progress at, you know, or decline at different rates. And so, um, you know, I've been in, in research now long enough that I'm hitting middle age and it's uh, it's starting. <laughs> Well, you know, so, yeah, I don't have, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't have, pres, was it presbyopsis yet that I I can feel, I can just, I'm holding my screen further and further away from my face. Presbyopsis, so, uh, in case. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. We all want to know, because we, you know, we want to improve our ability to understand speech and background noise. What is the pre-stimulus that can help us? What are you, what are you, what should we be doing? What does that yeah. pre-stimulus sound like? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, we we did a study where we looked at so um, Mark Mark Eckert was first author on this one, and we looked at visual cues, and we used visual cues that were either neutral, um, easy, or hard listening conditions. And so, unfortunately, it was a um, event related experiment, and without getting really too deep in the weeds, um, we weren't able to really look at pre stimulus activity effects in a way that wasn't confounded with trial order. So we had to kind of just set that effect aside in the paper. Um, but one thing that we did see fairly clearly was the fact that these SNR related effects that tend to also diminish for older adults um, came back. They were very pronounced when people could tell what the upcoming condition was going to be because of a visual cue. So I do think that it's worth paying some attention to, to changes in the room. You know, if you're in a loud restaurant and it's getting louder, like to do something with that information. And, and so, you know, there are there are, you know, much more ecologically valid cues that we can kind of, you know, clue into in order to, to help our performance. Um, there's a terrific question from Larry Medwetsky, and I'm going to just read it out loud and kind of read it slowly. Um, OK, is it possible that the processing speed, that is information collection process, varies among older individuals more so than younger individuals, and in turn, influence their decision-making abilities as well. Thus, yeah. is it possible that processing time and decision-making ability may be intertwined, and the ones who do the worst in speech and noise tasks, both time and accuracy, are the ones who are poor in both abilities? That's actually my hypothesis. I mean, that's my grant. I think that's I'm what you're saying so. in your presentation. <laughs> I, that's what I think I heard. Yeah, yeah. That's that's my hypothesis. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, I, well, so there's two pieces to this, right? So you may have declines that affect, and it could be hearing loss is a pretty good example, I think, that can impact your uh, um, information collection rate. So that's what I've been trying to, I, I think I've been letting it slip and evidence accumulation now and then, but it is information collection. Um, I think the speed at which we kind of gather information during speech um, can be affected by a lot of things that are in the environment. I think they can be affected by properties of the words, most likely. So, you know, is it a high frequency or low frequency word? It may slow you down or speed you up in terms of its recognition. Um, but yeah, I do think that absolutely that each of these things may age independently or together, right? So you may be unlucky and have um, a decision criterion that is really difficult to sort of move around and adjust. Um, and so, you know, that's one kind of aging hypothesis with respect to decision criteria is that they just don't move very much for some older adults. Um, so I think in combination, if you have a slow, you know, information collection and you have kind of a unflexible criterion, it's, it's kind of the worst of both worlds. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, one of our anonymous attendees says, regardless of age, is not the brain always working to discern speech? But, but they go on and, and they say, I see this after uh, I do auditory training, following a cochlear implant activation. I also notice that when I return to Ireland, it takes me a whole day to fully adjust again to the Irish accents. Yeah, yeah. 
No, I think that this process applies in a variety of different situations. So, you know, one reason that I think it was so helpful for it to 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 as a model for speech recognition and noise is that it's it's a, a way of measuring how people adapt to perceptually uncertain situations. But accents definitely um, they activate this network. It's known. So, yeah, yeah, this is something that people probably engage in any time that it's not obvious what was said. This, this may have been a question that was asked in a different way in our earlier conversation, but I'm going to go uh -huh. ahead and ask you. Jonathan Nedbor wants to know, what are the, some of the cognitive strategies that mm -hmm. can be used to enable better recognition? And um, can we use these as exercises? Kind of along the earlier about how do we yeah. be better and noise and stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I think the, the closed caption thing I think you mentioned is probably not a bad idea. So I think that you know, pairing stimuli, you know, pairing a visual stimulus with what you're hearing is, it's a, it's a good way to train. I think Larry Humes had a study where he showed that, um, where that's an effective way to kind of learn. He didn't do closed captions in movies and TV shows, um, but he did pair visual stimuli with um, auditory stimuli and showed that that actually could make a big difference for some people. Um, in terms of other things you might, you know, consider, I think, of course, anything that can contribute to, to better attention abilities or better working memory. I think those are generally recognized as sort of, of abstract from speech recognition and noise, but they really benefit it for some reason. So I, if nothing else, a good night's sleep might really help all of those things. <laughs> Should we be listening to the audible books? <laughs> I listen to books all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as as an yeah. obviously it's an exercise. To say. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think I don't think it hurts. Or, you know. yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I again, I think like anytime, anytime you can kind of pair things together, um, there definitely is a perceptual benefit. So if people are speaking, it doesn't, you know, it's not going to hurt to look at their faces and listen to what they're saying. That just pushes more information up to your criterion faster. Um, but I do think that, yeah, I think listening to audiobooks is a good way to to practice hearing people. Now, I will say this, that's speech in clear conditions, right? So in general, when you listen to an audiobook, it's a narrator reading book. And um, But I would say maybe in TV shows, especially, there's usually a fair amount of noise in addition to people talking. <laughs> Depends well, on the show. <laughs> yeah. Marlene Romoff wants to know, have you uh, given any thoughts on how this impacts cochlear implant users? A little bit, a little bit. So there is um, there there is a data set. I've been communicating with some researchers at MUSC regarding um, multimodal data and cochlear implants. And so I am kind of eager to kind of see how um, see how that process of either learning, you know, so adapting to the cochlear implant, um, as well as sort of individual differences prior or maybe at the outset. Um, I think that those two things would be really amazing to see. So you may be able to watch learning happen when people are performing at ceiling, but their reaction times are getting shorter and shorter. Or when people are performing at about the same level, but despite that, they're getting faster and faster at it. So this may give us sensitivity to, to some types of learning and adaptation that we really can't see just based on the percent correct score. Yeah. As you're thinking about your work in the long term, um, I. I it clearly it helps us understand what's happening as as we're getting older in terms of processing and processing with noise and stuff. Do you think you're going towards more basic understanding or intervention as well, or do you think they're going to feed on each other? That is, the more you learn about, um, just come out um, next yeah. five ten year vision about where, you know, or how you got your R one funded. You know exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 No. I I think um, I think that there there's both, right? So I think um, in terms of trying to understand age-related effects, um, there is a while there's a lot of research that's been done on visual object recognition, um, there's not much that's been actually done on aging, and so we don't know the degree to which aging or hearing loss or other things uh, may affect perceptual decision making or or in the narrower problem of speech recognition and noise in some cases. Um, but I think that like um, Oh, gosh, lost my train of thought, but I do think that when we um, when we zoom out to kind of clinical applications or other situations like that, I think the measurement the measurements that we're using a lot of times ignore time, and so we have this whole dimension of task performance that we're kind of setting aside in favor of what percent correct are people getting, 
And so I think that, you know, we can make very simple changes to a lot of the tests that are already being used in order to see what people are doing. You know, are they maxing out their criteria? And that's in some cases, they're just timing out because they're trying to get all the information, for example. You know, are they picking an extreme strategy? Um, is something kind of wrong with the strategy that they're using? Does something look a little off? And it, it may be that they have a low score or middle of the road score, but there's this whole dimension of task performance that we're not seeing. So I, I think like, so that kind of answers, I think that's the, the answer is like all of the above. Like there's a lot of really interesting basic science that we need, you know, a lot of interesting questions there, but also like we might be able to make small tweaks on what we're already doing and then benefit from, from what we're learning here. You know, your concept of uh, adaptive control, you know, the optimizing mm -hmm. performance by adjusting our attention and behavior. Like, it's interesting when I have people do something called a total heel gate, you know, that sobriety test. Uh -huh. They always fail the first time. I mean, when they first do it, but then I ask oh. them to do it again and they, and they pass with flying colors. It's almost like yeah. uh, how much attention do they need to provide? Can you talk a little bit about that? The whole concept of, yeah. of adaptive control was quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about it for some for our audience and in sure. terms of maybe strategies or even just our knowledge base? Yeah, yeah. Adaptive control, the first time we saw it in the literature, um, Jonas Oblesser and I think Yulia Erb um, wrote a paper where they were looking at, basically, it looked like kind of a learning effect in their data set. And I should say, we don't see very many learning effects. People's performance is fairly stable in our experiments because we would have a training session before they go to the scanner. So they familiarize with the task. Um, that being said, like the, the, the concept of adaptive control comes from like rockets. And so, you know, when you shoot a rocket into the air for it to hit its target, whether it's the moon or a military target or something else, the, ro the rocket needs to be able to kind of correct its trajectory as it's going, right? And so you can think of performance in a lot of different tasks, but speech recognition and noise is one as well where people will screw up very routinely, not get the right answer on the first trial, or maybe even the first two or three trials. And then something happens and they, very, they seem to switch gears and they're doing fine, <laughs> right? And so, you know, not everyone, I mean, there are gonna be people who perform at 30%, but they still perform at 30%. They're still getting some items right. And they weren't getting any items right at first. And so, yeah, we do see something that looks like an, an adjustment and, you know, in our experiments, a lot of times we, we vary the SNR. So we'll go for a few trials in a row where it's easier and then a few trials in a row where it's harder. And so we can see people kind of do an initial shift in terms of their reaction times. And, uh, and people will really slow down um, when they encounter their first difficult SNR trial. But as they go on, um, they speed up. Well, I think we may have loss, Dr. V. I'd so, I think we saw the on and off screens going on earlier. I, um, let's wait about 30 seconds to see if it comes right back. Um, there he is. Excellent. <laughs> Welcome back, Dr. V. Hey. We tried... <laughs> That was like a that was like a pre-stimulus to get ready for your return. Right. <laughs> I was keeping them entertained, singing songs while you were gone as a pre-stimulus. Oh, I missed and, it. And thank you for coming back. And in fact, uh, so you know you're talking about the pre-stimulus and the frontal cortex. Yeah. I always yeah. think of the frontal cortex as sort of an emotional cortex, you know, response to emotions, yeah. maybe even smell and so on. Are there yeah that we can do to active our frontal, activate our frontal cortex to improve our speech performance or our speech and noise performance? Or is that too far-fetched? I'm, I'm yeah, just no, I don't... the dots between weird stuff here because of what we, what I as a lay person know about the frontal cortex. Yeah. I, don't think about, I don't think about speech or understanding yeah. of speech and noise uh, and frontal cortex. So it's very interesting. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I think that you could definitely... I think at the very least, it's fair to say that people, um, that the frustration that people experience with speech rec recognition and noise when they can't do it or when they're having difficulty understanding um, most likely is kind of a motivation. And it's, you know, it's activating the, the, the amygdala and the rest of the diencephalon. And, you know, I'm sure that that actually is part of what sort of motivates these brain regions to come online. Yeah.
Yeah, I think I want to say that there was a relationship in one data set and it's it's a result that's it's been a long time since we saw it. So but I believe we had it in a paper where we we saw a relationship between people's, you know, experience on a NASA task load index type of survey where they said they were experiencing a lot of difficulty uh, or, or exertion with the task. And those were the people who were were um, not engaging this frontal system as much. And that pre-stimulus activity effect was very small for them. So I do think that there there's a link. And I think for people who are able to do the task, that that frustration you experience is kind of what pushes you to move on. But I don't know about um, sensory stimuli. That That's a really interesting thing that I hadn't thought about. Sort of the way that like a smell can bring a memory back, for example, if there's some way that you could kind of, yeah, maybe, maybe the smell of a crowded restaurant, you know, all the different <laughs> foods and wine, and you're like, uh oh, here's a loud room. <laughs> what thing about sensory yeah. input is the artwork in your slide in your talk? Is it yours? Or is it, uh, oh, yeah, it? yeah, can you talk yeah, about yeah, that? Was Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, yeah, a couple of years ago, um, I, I, this became kind of a hobby of mine and it was right before the pandemic. So perfect, perfect, uh, perfect recreation to kind of follow while you're stranded at home. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, but I, yeah, absolutely enjoy it. Um, I've taken a lot of the, what I've learned about coding just in my, my practice as a scientist and been able to apply a lot of what I've learned about making plots, scientific plots, very precise, lines and polygons and points and really turn that into art. So, um, you know, of course, there's one big difference is that in, in plotting data, it's data driven, it's real stuff. And <laughs> in art, a lot of times you're using random number generators to try to produce something that that looks interesting or beautiful. So, yeah, so but it's really interesting the kind of parallels in the two worlds. Yeah, yeah. No, and also how um, art ultimately reflects how we perceive the world and each one of our yeah. speech perception also it just turns on how we perceive words or sounds as so probably different. You know, if we create auditory yeah. art, it would be very much as varied as the visual arts, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. There is a there is a researcher, or not a researcher, but a, an artist who I've uh, I've met online who's from Japan. And he does this fantastic work that's um, where he records all kinds of sounds in the environment, um, you know, creeks, ocean waves, sometimes traffic and things like that. And he uses it to control these really fine line pictures. And they just, the patterns that emerge, you, you might not think, oh, that's a sound. <clears throat> but if you know sound is driving them, it's, you know, it's just amazing to see that. Yeah. So our, our, our last question, Dr. Vaden, and, and, and really it's just uh, been a wonderful conversation, uh, is right, one of our first questions that was asked by Tara Hastings. And she said, uh -huh. first of all, thank you for a very interesting talk. But how do you, and we kind of asked this question earlier, but this may be a way to summarize uh, your past and present work, but also your future work. How do you envision these findings informing clinical care in the future or strategies people can use to navigate these situations? Uh, and what's the next step for your research? So, um, and and with that, we'll start closing up after your answer. Take as long as you want. We got some time. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, you know, like like I said before, I do think that there may be some connections with clinical assessments, um, tools that really rely on accuracy. Um, but sometimes record, you know, sometimes it would be, it may be possible to either computerize and make people push buttons so we can get an idea of how quickly they could recognize things um, or record um, people's responses out loud. So I do think that we can generate response times for a variety of different clinical assessments and use that information to figure out why people are performing better than we expected or worse than we expected. Um, and also, you know, kind of looking at what strategies people are choosing. Um, I think that also may be able to feed into some, in some cases, some advice we'd be able to give people to the degree that somebody who seems stuck with a low criterion um, is identified and actually could move their criterion up a little, it may be a matter of telling people to slow down, you know, just to, to don't, you don't have to respond as quickly as you can, wait a beat, then respond. And you may see a miraculous improvement in accuracy because they've moved their threshold up. They're taking a lot more information into account for their recognition. And so I, I do think like there may be some intentional strategies that we can give people. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think in terms of like everyday experiences, um, you know, it, it, I think, uh, yeah, I guess we've, we've talked a little bit about, um, 
it's sort of how pre-stimulus activity may that, you know, we know that we, it appears that it's pushing around our decision criteria. Um, it may be in charge of other things like task focused attention. So, you know, we, if, if somebody's having a little bit of difficulty focusing on, on what they need to be listening to, or, um, you know, that sort of thing, I think this is the brain system that we're probably going to see doing something unusual during a task. So I don't know if that, that's a too direct answer, but yeah. I think that was great. I was going to say, I think, I think you're going to actually, I'm going to be a better spouse because, you know, because of your email meme where I kind of assume I know what my wife is going to say, I stopped listening. <laughs> I'm going to make it a point now to listen to every word and it'll help me not only be a better husband, but also be able to hear better down the road as I get older and older. So I think that's, that's right. helping me in my old age here. Just keep practicing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I just have to say thank you so much for a, a wonderful talk. Thank you for all, all, thank you all for your attendance and Dr. Vaden for this really informative presentation. Uh, we're so grateful to you, our community, uh, for your support of our Emerging Research Grants Program. Uh, for the scientists among the audience, the application for the next cycle of grants are on Monday, October the 28th. Please check hhf.org backslash ERG for information. And for the friends of Hearing Health Foundation, remember that you can donate to our efforts to advance better treatments and cures for hearing and balance conditions, much like Dr. Professor Vaden talked about today, by donating at hhf.org backslash donate. Now, thank you, and, and please enjoy the rest of your day. And again, thank you, Dr. Vaden. Thank you. Bye-bye.